Hello and welcome to Alex Toth in Depth. This is Paul Fricke, cartoonist, comics professor, and Toth fanatic. Uh, in this episode, we're going to cover what I think are the top 10 Toth stories to read. Now, if you heard the first episode, you know that I made a point of saying that there's a difference between Toth stories that you can study and those you can read. Um, because a lot of scripts are not always top-notch uh, in throughout comics history, um, Toth did a lot of work on stuff that was just okay. And there's a bunch of stories that are fun to read or, um, or they're decent stories, but um, a lot of those are left best to read through once and then study. But when presenting uh, Toth's work to people, I think it'd be a good idea to have a bunch of stories that you can read right off the bat and uh, that are engaging in their own right. Um, so this, I'm hoping, could be a, a guide and, and a good starting place for new Toth readers so they can actually enjoy the work, read the stories to see how he did on, on good stories, and then uh, and then further expand from there. We'll do another episode about Toth stories to study. Um there could be, with my list, uh, perhaps some discussion or argument uh, with Toth lovers and aficionados who may have their own favorites that may not be on this list. And some of those may already be on my to-study list for a future episode. But I tried my best to uh, balance this list and not repeat. There's some I just couldn't uh, have left off. And, um, and um, we'll see uh, if you agree. And then uh, uh, these stories can be found online. Uh, many of them have been printed or reprinted in books, um, but they're definitely uh, findable online. And uh, I will have, you know, all the uh, information about all these uh, stories in the show notes so you can uh, check things out. Now, because these are stories I'd like you to read and, uh, and enjoy, uh, there will be no spoilers in this episode. So to kick things off, um, I'm going to start with one of the uh, what I think is one of the best uh, comic short stories ever to have been done, which is uh, Toth's first uh, Torpedo 1936 story uh, written by Enrique Abula. Um, this was done for uh, an Italian publisher. Uh, the tone and content of the comic is, and the series is uh, very dark. It's noir. It, it, and uh, it was so dark that you can see Whereas Toth is fully engaged in this first story, in the second story that he did, and the last, um, he's not as engaged. It's still a good story. It's still well done, but it is even more stripped down. You can see he was going through things quicker, uh, and he spent a lot of time on this first one. Uh, this first uh, to torpedo story, um, he's using silhouette like nobody's business. It's all drawn with a... Uh, a simple six panel grid, all virtually square panels. He's using silhouettes incredibly. He's using um, all kinds of uh, uh, differentiation in character and character design. Um, and and there's just uh, some really, really nice um, scenes and segments in the story uh, that pack a punch. And again, I won't give up the ending, but it's a smartly structured and smartly written uh, comic. I think in this comic, there is kind of a perfect look um, with tone, uh, Toth's line and his simplicity. Um, he could often get cartoony with his uh, comics uh, later, especially in life. And in this one, there is a reality that he gets to while still being stripped down and uh, simplified. And this story, probably along with Bravo for Adventure, I think he hits that uh, the best. Um, and uh, it's just a story that you, you know, you can read once and, uh, and enjoy. Um, and, uh, and then reread and study and analyze. It's uh, untold things can be mined from it uh, with repeated uh, readings and uh, and viewings. Um, 
his uh, the character, the expressions, the body language, the composition, everything is just uh, in this story, and uh, and it's a it's a good one to boot. Um, so the second one I'd like to to uh, cover is uh, an early '50s story. We've got a a story from the '50s in this group, one from the '60s, and then a handful each from the '70s and '80s. Um, the ne- uh, next on my list would be the F-86 sta- Sabre Jet story from Frontline Combat, uh, drawn in 1953. This was written by Harvey Kurtzman and is a war story. And uh, this uh, comic, as many uh, that were done by Kurtzman in the 50s uh, for EC, um, you can see that he... Uh, would plan and lay out all his comics. He would meticulously research these comics, um, and then he would lay them out. He was very particular about um, the text and where it would go and uh, what the rhythms and pacing were for his comics. And really great illustrators were um, uh, working with him on a lot of comics during that period, and many of them, like John Severn and Wally Wood and uh, Jack Davis and many others would really go to town on illustrating this stuff. And I think Toth uh, strips down the the look um, in the few stories he did with Kurtzman. They, they ended up not getting along. I think that Toth liked to do his own thing, and Kurtzman bristled at that, and and Toth probably bristled at, uh, at uh, uh, Kurtzman's method that was kind of uh, rigid or strict. Um, and apparently Kurtzman was a little upset by some things Toth did in the story that he simplified and silhouetted some figures where uh, he didn't expect them there to be. But I find this to be a perfect melding of their talents, uh, two giants of uh, the comics history. And uh, there's no way to separate who, uh, well, there is a way to separate it. Kurtzman, I think, is responsible for a good, solid story without overwriting. A lot of EC stories I find are overwritten um, with a lot of text, and they're not a perfect melding of word and picture, although they did great stories early in comics, American comics history anyway. And this one is not overwritten. Um, plus, the layouts really work well. It is not hard to follow. Um, the the beats and the rhythm are, are, uh, are chosen well. Um, and then I think that, you know, Kurtzman is probably um, responsible in large part for the color design, but I, I think Toth took it even further with how he uh, uh, simplified and, and made it even more graphic. Um, the reason I like this story so much isn't because I'm into planes, as you know, and Toth was certainly. Um, I'm not that into it, but I think this is a powerful example about what comics can do well. If you were trying to get the experience of what it would be like to fly uh, a jet plane, people put you in simulators, right? And they give you some of the experience of what it would be like. But I don't think it gets to the heart of it of what it's like for um, or a pilot or a driver to, to do that kind of thing. And this comic is drawn in such a way, the way Toth, uh, what he chose to put in and, and how he simplified things. You don't get a, a you know a lot of reaction shots or expressions from uh, the character uh, in the story. You're mainly seeing uh, planes close up, planes in the distance, a pilot with his face covered, things silhouetted, and almost diagrammatic simplified panels one after another. It can seem if you're just glancing through it and go, "Wow, that's striking," but it can feel cold. When you read it, though, I think you get the sense early on, and, and there's a panel here, and Kurtzman writes, but I'll tell, uh, I'll tell what it's like flying one. And that's the sense you get when you're reading this. Because of his approach, because of Toth's approach, you get the sense with this more, I think, than in a simulator of what it would be like to be in it and how to think through the problems one would uh, find, uh, you know, being in the cockpit. Um it's really well done and one of the classics of comics ever done, and I, I highly recommend it uh, for all those reasons. And again, there's been some disagreement on this story about things Toth chose to do or uh, whether he should have chosen different shots later in the story especially. And uh, 
I disagree because I think that that a, a lot of what's happening in this story and the way Toth chose to put things down uh, adds to the uh, disorientation of the pilot. And then hence, as we read, we can uh, empathize or get that feeling. It, you cannot get the sense of this story unless you read it. Um, next, we're going to switch to a, a fun later comic. Um, some time ago, maybe 10 years ago, I heard Darwin Cook say uh, that, you know, Toth being one of his favorites, maybe he wouldn't recommend Toth for, uh, to study for superhero work. Um, but my next choice is the Black Canary story he did that uh, was written by Danny O'Neill. And I find this comic to be just a joy. It's, <laughs> it's really well done superhero comics. Um, and it's a lot of fun to look at. Now, a lot of, of these stories um, either haven't been reprinted or when you find them online, they're from scans. And uh, with this Black Canary story, it's just, it's cleaned up and, and you can find a version online that is cleaned up and, and with brightly colored stuff. And it follows the original coloring, which is really well done. Uh, you know, you, you, there's a lot of bad comics coloring over the decades, uh, either early on because of the limitations of comics coloring in the printing process or later because of over coloring and kind of airbrushy computerized effects. And this comic just pops with a lot of primary colors, but the drawings of, uh, uh, uh black canary and Diana in this, uh, are, uh, gorgeous. Uh, you can tell he really enjoyed drawing it. Green arrow takes a back seat in the story. Um, and uh, in some cases, he sticks to grids, and in other cases, he opens it up. There's a lot of different characters drawn in this story, um, a lot of different character types that are a lot of fun. Um, and, and then in a couple sections at least, um, he breaks the action down bit by bit that's just beautifully uh, and smartly choreographed and, and looks great on the page. Um, some of the shots he does here... Um, are cropped and close up and they're, uh, they add to uh, Black Canary's uh, predicament in the story and, and put you in her uh, situation uh, very well. And it's a, it's a, it's a woman power story and Black Canary has uh, got to do it on her own. And of course is more than capable, but this is a fun, smart story by O'Neill and Toth uh, holds up well, well worth reading and uh, really solid, fun comics. Next on my list is a comic from the mid sixties. This one is from 1966, um, done for Warren's, uh, horror magazines. This one's written by Archie Goodwin and he and Toth did a, a bunch of stories together. This one is called the monument and it is in some ways, um, a basic, you know, uh, twist ending kind of silly, um, uh, classic horror story of the EC and then Warren and then DC tradition. And, um, but this one holds up really well. It, it is, you know, smart, um, and fun. And, uh, you know, there's one particular, uh, Noel Sickles illustration and Toth was pretty much worshiped Sickles. Um, and I mentioned Sickles in the first episode, um, but there's one particular illustration that I think is from the fifties, uh, that where he's using white, black, and tone in such a way it's super sharp. And I would not be surprised if this story is toast version of doing a comic in something like that style. His use of tone here is very pretty. Now in the most recent Warren uh, horror collection. I don't, I think some of the grays don't reprint quite as well. So if you can find this one online, um, it's probably preferable, but if you like stuff collected in a book, it's, it's, uh, and having all that, uh, war and horror stuff that Toth did in one book is, uh, is handy to have on, my sh on the shelf and I have it there. Um, but my gosh, um, the, the drawing in this, uh, is unbelievable by, by Toth. His line is incredible. It's loose, but tight. There's a lot of expression in it. Um, um, but it's simple. It, and this is another story that's not really super, uh, 
uh, cartoony, but it's not super realistic either. It's really smartly done and it looks great. It, and as in many cases with Toth, he will, uh, when he's lettering his own stories, will tailor the look of the lettering to go with the story or just to change things up. And this has a, a more bouncy kind of look to it um, that fits, um, you know, how he is uh, going about the art as well. Um, uh, so this one is worth, I mean, boy, there's not a bad shot in here. I mean, there, and he's designing like this, uh, uh, this house of an architect. And, you know, looking at this, you can guess that Toth could have easily been an architect his uh, career. If he was an illustrator, he could have been one of the best illustrators. Um, if he wanted to do car plane design, he could have done that. He really could have done any of those things. And, uh, you know, if you like comics, it's to our benefit that he, uh, he chose to do comics and, uh, and animation design instead, but read the monument. It's fun. And then, you know, once you read it, just pour over every panel because there's not a stinker in there. Um, next on the list is a war story, um, called white devil, yellow devil. This is from 1972 and this is written by Bob Kaniger. Um, and it is a classic, uh, war tale, um, this uh, this uh, from the DC uh, war line takes its cue from Kurtzman's earlier war comics in that it's showing you the sadness and futility of war. And uh, this one does it better than most in comics history. Toth in this story is breaking pages up in different ways. He's using small panels. He's using a, a traditional grid in, throughout most of it, but he will break it up into more vertical panels sometimes. He will change the, the width of each panel. He would break up into small panels or, you know, three on a tier instead of two. Uh, and then he'll go to the simple grid when it, when it comes down to it. It all depends on how he wants to break up the action, what he wants to emphasize, uh, and how he wants to create the rhythm in the story. Um, I think more than most, uh, Toth would take the script and then try to elevate it. And some editors and writers probably didn't like that, but I'm glad he did. He was usually right. A uh, couple things on this. Some parts of this uh, comic as originally printed are really well colored and other parts are not. Sometimes it helps Toth with, with what he thought was busy uh, shadowing on some of the figures or backgrounds. And I think he's right. In some cases, the colorist helped or saved him. And in other parts, I think uh, it loses something because of how it's colored. But it's pretty well colored for a comic of its day. And this, again, is early 70s. Um, and uh, this speaks to Toth's personality that when he got these pages returned from DC, he went back in and simplified further and uh, dropped more shadows on figures or uh, in backgrounds and this can all be seen, I think, in the second um, of the large Toth books. Originals are in there, and these are the, the ones he doctored after the fact. It'd be nice if DC or somebody could reprint these with nice coloring with, from Toth's revised uh, originals. But who does that? Gets their originals back and then starts poking away and, and finishing it even after it's been printed. And if you don't, um, uh, if you read this once and you don't look at it ever again, uh, just go to the bottom of uh, bottom right of uh, page two is one of the best comic shots ever. It's an extremely difficult panel to pull off where a soldier is uh, rubbing his tongue on his gold teeth. And it is almost impossible to convey. And it is unbelievable. Now there's some uh, disagreement over who's responsible from the, for this. Toth, in the end, didn't care who got credit for it. Kanegar tried to take credit for it. I doubt that that kind of detail was in the script. It could have been, but it seems like the kind of detail that Toth would have done. And even if Kanegar suggested it uh, a little bit, um, I would guess, guess most artists would not have pulled it off or pulled it off this well. So White Devil, Yellow Devil, read that one. Um, going back just a couple years from 72 is Toth's uh, Hot Wheels, The Case of the Curious Classic, done in 1970. Now, this uh, comic uh, he wrote and drew himself. It was kind of a baby for him, and he had it in his head that he was not a writer. And 
in some cases with his stories, he's right. Um, he's got a good concept, but he is uh, in his head while he's doing it. And he, and the structure and the pacing can be totally off or he overwrites for a guy who likes simplification so much. He didn't always pull that off in his writing and he was very verbose. So, um, uh, in a lot of his stories, it's overdone. Um, uh, certainly true of his earlier John Fury work and, and other things he wrote himself uh, for Warren and other places. But with this Hot Wheels story, with Curious Classic, he is on point and it is a fun, really well put together story. It's uh, mysterious. He gets to draw um, his favorite car um, and and um, there's a lot of mystery and, and, uh, and history and uh, tone in this book. Um, and it's just, I think, about 16 pages of Toth uh, really at his finest. Um, for so many of his stories that don't hold up that he wrote himself, this one really does. It's a, it's a smart, clever, well-paced, fun read um, and uh, nicely done. Um, there's a whole bunch of sequences in here where he crops tightly and creates mystery with a lot of shadow and you still don't get lost. Um, there's a bunch of characters in here that are, uh, you know, there are farmers and there are, you know, hot rod um, uh, repairmen and all the hot wheels crew and, and so on. Everybody is really delineated. Well, uh, he's got a bunch of different types and they all read very quickly um, they're not too cartoony and they're not slavishly drawn and too realistic. It's, it's just really beautiful to look at and you can study these over and over, but you know, don't forget, read it all first. It's a good story. Um, Toth tackled this one in an eight panel grid and then sticks to it. Now that basically ends up looking kind of like a TV or movie screen. And then it kind of has a feeling of, uh, and the, of the rhythms and look of a storyboard. Uh, and of course, you know, with balloons all over the place, um, it still is and reads as a comic. And in a couple places, it's a little overwritten, but really, you don't, uh, it doesn't feel really crowded in most of it. It's well balanced and some, and sometimes he, uh, uh, he opens things up so they can really breathe in, you know, a multi-panel sequence. It's really uh, nicely done. On one page in the middle, there's a, uh, a car chase. And boy, on that page, and the originals are in uh, one of these uh, big books again uh, that IDW put out. But that page is worth looking at in and of itself, just for the patterns and textures that he put in um, into that page. And there's a lot of that going on throughout the whole story. But um, very nicely done, uh, very enjoyable read, and. And, and plenty to study after you've read as well. So kudos to Toth for pulling off a, a story that he uh, concocted and wrote on his own. Um, now, only going forward a year, uh, we switch to a favorite of mine, um, the comic I own the original, and it's, so it's long been a favorite, far before I was able to find anything online about this. It's Soldier's Grave from 1971 written by Bob Kaniger again. And this is uh, one of my favorite all-time Toth stories, and it reads really well. It looks great. Now, this is one of the best colored, in my view, of Toth's comics. And again, I don't, I don't know who colored this, but it's really well put together. The balance of warm and cool colors is gorgeous. Toth in this one doesn't stick with the grid quite as much. And he opens up a lot of panels into these super panoramic, super widescreen shots that are so pretty and so beautiful. Um, and uh, the, it all seems to be dictated by the needs of the the action and the, uh, in this case, a lot of bow and arrow stuff and fights that are going on. And, you know, he's ver he uses vertical panels where they uh, will aid him in the action and storytelling and movement and uh, but in a lot of uh, places he's using the super widescreen uh, to do the same now this is a story that uh, probably is about as realistic as toth gets uh, it is boldly and aggressively drawn um, 
he's putting his marks down in, in kind of rough and uh, confident fashion, even in, you know, things like a delicate sunset. He's very bold in how he's rendering it. Um, you can tell that he did a lot of research or some anyway on, uh, you know, what people would wear at the time of this story, which is in ancient Egyptian times. And it's a, it's a very nice war story. And then it's about the heroism of a single, um, uh, a, a single soldier, um, somebody who is just a beggar and who's looking to make some money or make a mark for his family um, and takes a, a stand. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the best toast stories to read, period, and uh, also uh, bears fruit upon repeated um, studies panel to panel. So check this one out. This one doesn't get talked about as much, but it's it's easily in the top 10 in my view. Next is something called The Reaper. This one, again, written by Archie Goodwin. This one was done uh, in 1980 for um, Warren's Hor Horror Magazines. This has been well written about um, by James Romberger online. And given the uh, times we're living in uh, with the pandemic, this one couldn't be more timely to uh, read. Um, it, the prologue starts with the word smallpox and then some text and then vaccination and so on and so forth. This is a very dark story um, about the bitterness of one man and, and uh, the difficulty he's having with uh, a, a diagnosis he's got, not much time to live, and, uh, and then what he does in reaction to that. He finds it all very unfair. This is a, a cynical, dark, horrible story, but it it's got a bit of um, black humor to it in a fashion, but only a little bit. Um, Goodwin structured this story where he goes back and forth. Uh, sometimes that can be a little confusing, but if you pay attention and carefully read it, it only jumps back and forth between two different days and if you follow it closely, it makes perfect sense and I think keeps the, the keeps the uh, story moving and, and helps with the reveal. Um, the look of this story is kind of unbelievable. If uh, Eduardo Russo or, um, you know, Frank Miller with Sin City were not um, influenced by this Toth story in particular, I would be very surprised. He is using a extremely thin and delicate, simple line, and then very bold blacks. He has keyed this up um, with his chiaroscuro effects um, that I think complement um, the uh, the content of the story. Uh, but. Uh, unlike a lot of the other stories we've talked about where he is still keeping with a the grid, there is a grid to some of these pages, but he is opening up the, uh, the uh, layout of these pages in dramatic way just to have fun, but it's very dynamic how he's putting it together. In some cases, he's bleeding panels together with no borders. In others, he's letting them breathe with lots of negative space. Uh, in others, he's using large uh, circular um, uh, shapes within the story to uh, uh, to give us a different uh, look on the page. Um, he'll stack panels uh, next to each other and stagger them. Um, and he'll use diagonals in different panels and then, you know, circular um, uh, inset panels uh, and, and other graphic tricks throughout. It You can learn so much from this story. It's really uh, great to read. And again, a nice payoff and very dark and apropos given our current situation. Um, but, uh, really well put together. And then last note on this again, Toth doesn't ever seem to be satisfied with something he's done before. And he's always playing with not only layout or the look or the style, but also with his, uh, balloon and lettering treatments. And this one, he's almost got like a, 
uh, uh, where there aren't tails on the balloons, but these little notches within the balloons to point to the direction of the uh, character speaking. It's really interesting. I don't see anybody really doing this one particularly. I think it works. Um, and um, uh, boy, there's just not much here you can't learn from. Uh, really well uh, put together. Again, a little bit of a dark tale. To balance that, I go to the next one uh, drawn in 83, just a few years later. We're going to cover two stories in this case. It's hard not to group them. The uh, Fox stories he did in 1983 for uh, Red Circle. Um, these are like the Black Canary story, uh, simple and fun and uh, primary colors and iconic in how he has drawn the character. There's a lot of things going on with how he treats the fox's eyes, where they're, they, he changes the shape of the eye to uh, get expression across, even though the character's wearing a mask. And you can see um, later on, like with, you know, when they switched uh, Spider-Man's uh, costume for a time to black, that they, uh, the cartoonist then started using that. And that, uh, that was just a few years later, really. Uh, where they started using a similar trick. Toth did this story, These both of these stories, he wrote them himself um, in tribute to uh, his friend and mentor, Erwin Hasten. Hasten did a lot of uh, comics uh, starting in the late 30s, uh, including some of the Fox. And then he went on later to do um, a couple decades um, of a comic strip called Dondi. Um, and, you know, as a kid, I didn't, I didn't care for it, and I've grown to appreciate it more and more. Hasten went on to teach for decades at the Joe Kubert School of Cartooning, and um, you only hear good things about Hasten, and um, and Toth admired him greatly. And you can see that in these stories. Again, iconic shots all the way through. Some parts of this these stories are really well colored and really pop and other parts not colored very well at all. But these are fun stories. A lot of times Toth... Um, could uh, seem uh, a little down or dark or negative uh, about himself or about the state of the world or entertainment. And in many cases, he would balance that with fun stuff like this. Um, he seemed to be hearkening back to an earlier time and got nostalgic. And this, these are pretty much fun, bouncy um, adventure comics. And uh, you can see him probably thinking of and riffing off of adventure movies from the 30s and 40s that he grew up with. Um, and a lot of the action uh, or violence in the stories are done off panel and are treated with in humorous fashion. I don't think that they ever get too violent. You know, there's fist fights and things like that. And it's all drawn with big floating stars around people's heads and large sound effects. And it's a, it's a fun little story, this first one. The second one is called um, uh, The Most <clears throat> Man in the World, and it features an, an old guy, inventor named Otis Dumb, a D-U-M-M. -M. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned in the first episode that I was, you know, a fan of Toth's work when I was a kid without realizing who he was. And then by my early teens, I was, you know, starting to see his name and copying his work. And, you know, in some cases, I remember drawing like a Dino Mutt and Blue Falcon drawing because I was taken with the uh, with the characters in the cartoon. I didn't realize that Toth had designed them. And, and then um, just a handful of years later, I spotted these comics on the, uh, on the, in the comic shop on the shelves and snapped them up. And this, I think, you know, when you're younger, I think everyone has a tendency as an artist to, you know, prove they can draw and learn how to draw and put a lot of detail in and be as realistic as possible. And these stories, especially the Otis Dumb one, just hit me right between the eyes. And I started like trying to emulate Toast's work at this time when these came out in 1983. And it, again, it took some years before I could really start implementing that and shed myself of a lot of the busyness um, in, in my work. Um, but this Otis Dumb story is, is really fun. Um, it's told fairly well. The pacing isn't too bad. Um, and uh, you know, not only does Toth has a lot of fun with uh, different characters in this story, 
Um, but with the storytelling and with the page layouts and design, uh, some coloring in here doesn't hold up well. I'd really like to see this story in black and white sometime, but I've not been able to track that down uh, anywhere. Um, you might want to, if you ever get a chance to go to tothfans.com and look at the annotated Toth, that Toth would annotate his own stories. Um, you can see that they, he and I think David Cook, who uh, sent those to Toth, uh, are talking a little bit about how Toth is using balloons to weave the eye, um, the reader's eye, through the, the pages and panels. And he does that in his story very well. It's, it looks like he's drawing these. I don't know if they're two sides, but they very well could be. It's a simplified line. He used a marker a lot of the times for the drawings. And... Um, and you can see that it's simple and bold and chunky and, um, and, and these stories are, you know, colored in bright colors mainly. So they're just a lot of fun, um, and they pop and they, uh, they're easy reads. Um, but you know, I think in some ways that was an antidote to, um, what was going on in his head sometimes or foul moods. And that was part of his character as well. And I think it would be, uh, a mistake, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, include some of these fun stories in here, which I think hold up well in our good reads. Um, so, you know, balance that out and make sure you're reading some of these things that he did later in his career, and that a little more fun as well. Taps. This is a short and elegiac piece that Toth drew in 1981 as a tribute to uh, Russ Manning and Wally Wood, fellow cartoonists who had passed uh, that year. Uh, I'm not sure if the title of this piece was suggested to Toth by uh, the sound of a mournful trumpet, uh, taps that one would hear um, at a military funeral, and he was seeing his compadres off. Um, but whatever the genesis, he converts that uh, word taps into a tap dancer who uh, taps dances through these five uh, pages and it, it's he's a funny little cartoony character with a white suit and tie and, and hat, kind of a uh, iconic smiley face dude uh, who's joyful. And uh, it, it becomes very apparent um, as he's tap dancing through and for a crowd um, that they're not quite understanding. They're surprised by him. They think he's a little nuts. Toth actually uses... Uh, question marks and uh, exclamation points on the faces themselves of some of these characters. There's not much uh, lettering in this. It's largely a silent piece, um, but there's a couple balloons and words uh, while they start grumbling, and then uh, their grumbling gets louder and louder and overtakes him. Uh, it, it's an interesting bookend uh, piece. There's an interesting, you know, kind of uh, flow to the piece um, that starts dark, then there's a lot of activity with the dancing and such. Uh, and ends dark again. Um, I think some people think this is a trifle, a simple short piece, and there's not much to it. But I think it's a deep rumination um, for Toth about death and about um, the nature of our mortality and, and what one works for and uh, about whether artists are understood by their uh, audiences. Uh, I think Toth might have felt sometimes that he wasn't understood or wasn't appreciated. Um, and uh, this is a, you know, a, a joyful in some cases, but a bittersweet um, piece as well. It's it's rather poetic. And if you have given a short trift before, I would recommend you reconsider and read it again and, and, and take it in. Because um, I think no top 10 list um, could be complete without uh, this wonderful piece, Taps. So that wraps up our top 10 list. I hope um, that if you are able to uh, seek these out and read them, that you enjoy reading Toth. Um, I hope that if you uh, are a Toth fan already and you are not sure about my list, and you uh, have others to recommend, uh, I'm happy to have that uh, conversation. And um, uh, at the very least, I'd like people to read stuff, but also want to create a dialogue about Toth's work. Um, and so leave comments. Um, and uh, and we can, uh, we can have a, a back and forth about this and argue to eternity if you'd like. Uh, 
So that's all the time we're giving to this episode. This again is Paul Fricky for the Alex Toth In-Depth Show. Comments, questions, or compliments, please email paul at opalo.com or uh, at, at Alex Toth In-Depth on Instagram. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Just type in Alex Toth In-Depth uh, and leave a quick positive review. Please tell your friends. There's also a video version of this uh, show on uh, YouTube. So subscribe there and spread the word and leave comments there as well. So until next time, go with Toad. And always remember, simplify.